I'll talk about something that is not yet on the archive, but uh, I'm just excited about it, so I didn't want to talk about something else. So it's a problem that I've been working for for some time. And the recent progress was actually spurned by, um, by a paper by Susanna uh, on the archive uh, months ago. And it led to lots of rethinking on our side. And so, so the problem is to estimate parameters of a quantum Markov chain in the so-called input-output formalism. And we want to do that optimally in an asymptotic sense. So when time of this Markov chain goes to infinity, so it kind of fits in the, in the topic of the conference from finite to infinite. So there is some infinite limit uh, here in there. And this work with Federico Giotti, who is also in Nottingham, and Alfred Godley, who is uh, my PhD student. Okay. There's some sound coming. Yeah, I noticed that. coming from there on that on the speaker. I don't know why. Carry on. I'll just go and talk. Okay. So ignore the sound coming from somewhere else. Um, yeah, so I'll just talk a bit about parameter estimation and then move, move to input output systems and tell you what the problem is. So uh, in quantum statistics, you know, we have the, this kind of typical problem. We have a state that depends on some parameter theta, and we want to estimate this. This, this parameter is unknown. We want to estimate it, so we do a measurement. We get some data, some random data, which has some distribution that depends on theta. And from this data, we want to produce some estimator, OK? And uh, if you fix the measurement, then it's just like a classical estimation problem. You can use tools from classical statistics. But what's quantum about it uh, is that you can optimize over these measurements. So you can look for measurements that are um, best at extracting information about this unknown parameter. And kind of the simplest way to express this is for the quantum kramer rao bound. So if you have an unbiased estimator, theta hat, and you look at its variance, then the bound says, the classical kramer rao bound says that the variance is always bigger than the inverse Fisher information associated to this probability distribution. And now if you optimize over these measurements, you find that uh, the lowest possible value of this is something called the inverse quantum Fisher information. And the inverse quantum Fisher information is a property of your statistical model, so of your family of states. And the question is, uh, of course, how, you know, what measurements achieve this Fisher information and, and others? Mm -hmm. Okay. So just a couple of examples. So the simplest, probably the simplest example is just a rotation model for a qubit. So you have this rotation, of the zero state with angle theta. Okay. So, um, the quantum Fisher information in general is um, you can always choose your phase of the of the pure state psi such that psi dot is orthogonal to psi theta. Yeah, so it's just a choice. And if you make that choice, then the quantum Fisher information is just four times the norm square of the derivative of psi. So it tells you how fast the the state is changing with the parameter theta. That's the Fisher information. So in this case, it's just equal to four. It's a kind of a rotation model. And now let's look, it doesn't matter which parameter you take. So let's look at parameter theta equal to zero. Um, and let's take a basis in this uh, circle on the block sphere. So the circle described by all these states. So if you choose some arbitrary basis there, okay. You calculate, you find that the Fisher information, the classical Fisher information for that measurement is equal to the quantum Fisher information. And this is true for any value of uh, the angle of this basis. So no matter which basis you take, they are all optimal. They achieve the quantum Fisher information, which is a bit surprising. You would expect that uh, this basis should be the optimal one because it's orthogonal to your vector and it sees uh, the, uh, the change in the angle, but actually because of how probabilities depend on theta, any basis is optimal. However, there is one that is not optimal, 
which is the base, the standard basis itself. So that is the basis along which your vector, your state lies uh, for parameter value theta equal to zero. And in that case, the Fisher information is zero. And to, you can understand this because uh, basically around this parameter value theta equal to zero, if you move the state left or right, uh, and you measure in the standard basis, you'll get the same probabilities. So there is some non-identifiability issue uh, around zero in this basis. And uh, that's why Fisher information is zero. Okay, and kind of uh, the opposite uh, end of the spectrum, you have say a Gaussian shift model where you have a coherent state, which um, just has parameter, the mean of, of the position operator multiplied by some constant, and you want to estimate this, this parameter u here uh, that is multiplied by the constant. So uh, the quantum Fisher information here is just this f. And again, you can take the parameter to be equal to zero for simplicity. And um, obviously, if you measure q, that's, that will be the optimal measurement for estimating the mean of q. And it achieves the quantum Fisher information. Um, and if you measure, uh, say, the number operator, so you are here, this is your state, and you measure the number operator, then the Fisher information will be zero. And again, it's an issue of non-identifiability because if you move the state to the left or to the right, you will get two Poisson distributions with the same intensity, so it's non-identifiable. Okay, so uh, now this is something for later on. It looks like the number operator is not good, but we'll show that actually with a slight modification, you can make it good. And that's one of the things that um, you know, we, we realized very recently. Uh, we've always been thinking in terms of finding measurements for this kind of quadratures in our setup, but actually we can also use number operator in a certain way. Okay, so this is the kind of system that I'm interested in. So input output systems. Um, you know, they are very important in physics. They appear in two Nobel Prizes uh, in recent years. So uh, the, the Poppen box of Serge Haroche and LIGO, they are input output systems. So you have here, you have some atoms coming, going through a cavity, they interact with the cavity field and they come out and they carry information about whatever happens in the cavity field. And then you can measure them and you obtain information about that. Uh, interaction. You can do other things like feedback and stuff. Okay. Um, so uh, um, there is a lot of theory related to this input output formalism. There is the quantum filtering theory, you know, feedback control, quantum networks. And in control theory, um, estimation of dynamics is an important topic. So it's a sort of the other side of the coin uh, with respect to control so, or system identification. That's the kind of problem that uh, uh, I want to solve. So mathematically, so I will work in discrete time just for simplicity, but you can do everything in continuous time. So what you have is a system CD, and you have um, you know, a chain of atoms. So that's the input. They come prepared identically so in a product state, and um, they interact sequentially with the system with some unitary u, which depends on some unknown parameter theta. Okay. And I'm interested in estimating this parameter theta, but uh, I'm not going to uh, measure the system as it's often um, uh, considered, but uh, what I'm going to measure is the output. So after the interaction, the input moves further, and here you produce an output. It's a correlated state. It's a essentially a matrix product state, and you want to measure this output and get information about the theta. Okay, so the system output state, if I start in a pure initial state, uh, I apply this unit that is one by one, you can expand it in a product basis for the output, you get this cross operator supplied to the initial state of the system. So um, now you could do a, a standard basis measurement on the output, and then uh, this would be the state of the system conditional on those outcomes. And the square of this would be, the norm square would be the probability of these outcomes. 
but I'm not going to assume that I do any measurement. Okay, so I'm just sitting on the quantum level and I'm looking at this quantum state. It's a pure state. So, uh, you know, it's in principle, it's easy to analyze from the statistical point of view. Your U, does it shift also or something shifts? Yeah, the atom shift, or if you if you want, you can think that the system moves. Okay, I the yeah, other, but, but there are shifts involved in this. Yes, product. there is a shift, yeah. So U, U1 acts on these two and U2 acts on these two yeah. and you see, yeah. Um, okay, so um, if you look at the system, so the reduced evolution of the system is given by the transition operator with this uh, Krauss's. Um, and I'm going to assume that uh, this is uh, primitive, so it's aperiodic and has a unique stationary state. So you will converge to the stationary state. And now in the stationary regime, the output state also becomes translationally invariant, okay? So this is the output state. It depends on theta through the process, and that's what I want to understand. Okay, so one result that we, uh, we found some time ago is about the quantum Fisher information of this output state. Uh, it's actually the same result for system and output or only output. Uh, so for primitive systems, the Fisher information increases linearly with time. So uh, the coefficient, the leading order is this F, and it has this formula in terms of the stationary state and derivatives of the Krauss's with theta. And there is this uh, inverse of one minus T. Um, okay, so this is asymptotic. We've been also looking at things like uh, what happens when you have a system with a small spectral gap so you are sort of near a sort of phase transition. Uh, it turns out that uh, and this inverse can blow up so you, you can get large Fisher information. So there is some practical uh, applicability of this. Um, so the, the QFI can scale quadratically for some time of the order one over the, over the spectral gap, but then it will become linear. Uh, if you actually have a system that has multiple stationary states, then you can have uh, Heisenberg, so quadratic scaling of the Fisher information rather than linear in certain, for certain parameters. So we have now something that, uh, so we have a complete characterization of the situation, uh, but that's a sort of different, different question. And um, also you can do this for, not just for one dimensional parameter, but for completely unknown dynamics. Yeah, so full parametrization, and in that case, this quantum Fisher information provides uh, a Riemannian metric on the space of parameters, on the space of identifiable parameters. And this is sort of the information geometry of this problem. Anyway, so this is all nice. It tells you what's the quantum Fisher information, but how do you extract this information? Uh, and it turns out that standard sequential measurements, so if you just measure the outgoing atoms in the standard basis, uh, that will have some information, but it will not be achieving this quantum fission. Yeah. Even as it Okay. Uh, and now we, so actually there is more that we understand about this uh, statistical model of the output state. It satisfies so-called uh, local asymptotic normality. So, so what's the meaning of this asymptotic normality? So, um, it's a local concept in the parameter space. So you can always assume that you know the parameter up to an uncertainty of the order one over square root of n, because you could take a subsample very short compared to the full uh, length and estimate the parameter roughly. And you find yourself in a region. So you find some preliminary estimator, say theta tilde, and your theta will be in a region around theta tilde of the order n to minus one half plus some s, so slightly bigger than n to minus one half. So then I can write my parameter, <coughs> the true parameter as uh, theta zero, so this theta tilde, uh, theta zero plus u divided by square root of n. And this u I call the local parameter, okay? And it makes sense to do it like that because this ball shrinks as one over square root of n. So I can, um, I can write limit things in terms of this local parameter u. And this is asymptotic normality it says, if you take, so this is for the 
pure state of system together with the output. So if I take the state of system and output for, for local parameter U, and I take the overlap with the system output state of parameter V, this inner product will converge to the inner product of two coherent states. And uh, they are just uh, you know, along the Q axis and they have means which are proportional to these local parameters U and V. And the constant is the square root of the Fisher, quantum Fisher information. So this is you know, very easy to sort of understand geometrically. In the Hilbert space, we just have pure state. So we, we can think in terms of the vectors. And uh, basically the geometry of your model as n goes to infinity converges to the geometry of a coherent chief model. Okay, so you can make this into more fancy stuff. You can also um, extend it not to system plus uh, output, but, but only the output state, but you need a different formulation. And you can do it for a multiple parameters. So this is just one parameter. When you take all the parameters, you will have a, a multi-dimensional Gaussian here with means in uh, multiple oscillators. Um, but uh, one of the problems with this is that um, you know, this is kind of saying that in, in this space, uh, vectors look Gaussian, but it's not obvious what are the coordinates and momenta of this, so what are the canonical variables of this Gaussian thing. So it's not very explicit in terms of observables. And these observables, we can actually write them down formally, but um, they are hard to um, access um, sequentially. And that's a that's kind of problem. Okay. So now this is the main idea of, uh, of our scheme. And uh, we use a coherent quantum uh, or quantum coherent absorber. So we learned this from this paper here uh, where it's presented in, in continuous time, but you can write it in the, in the in discrete time as well. Uh, in a previous paper that I'm not going to talk about today, we used it also to do optimal estimation, but in a different way. So we use the absorber and then we, we did, we are doing uh, adaptive measurements on the output. So at every time step, the measurement that you do will be uh, different and it will be computed in a certain way depending on the previous measurement and so on. And we showed that that is optimal. However, it's, um, it's not, we couldn't extend it to continuous time. So the, the variability of the measurement basis doesn't converge to some sort of diffusion in the space of measurements in continuous time. Uh, but then we uh, we learned about uh, this paper that I mentioned uh, by Susanna and Martin, and uh, they proposed to just do photon counting, so counting measurements. So we are really curious to understand. So I, I, I always thought that counting is not really the thing to do because I have this picture in mind I need to measure the quadrature because my state is Gaussian, so I need to measure the coordinate of that. Okay. okay. However, uh, I think the counting measurements are good, um, and I'll I'll show you why and how to do it. Um, so, because okay, so I actually I haven't explained what, what the coherent absorber is. Um, so the idea with the coherent absorber is this: that you instead of having just the system interacting with the atoms. After that interaction, you interact the, uh, the input with a second system called the absorber. And this absorber is, has a unitary, which is matched to the uh, unitary of the system and, and uh, input in such a way that together they have a pure stationary state. So basically if I, so there is a pure stationary state uh, of system and absorber. If I apply first the unitary of the system and then the unitary of the absorber, uh, that joint unitary will leave that state invariant and the input that comes in state chi will come out in the state chi as well. So that's why it's called the absorber because it absorbs the sort of excitations that come out of in the output. And now the output is just the product state, like the vacuum state, right? And it's very neat concept, uh, it's kind of canonical, also it's not unique. Um, so I thought this must be useful for estimation for, <laughs> for some reason. 
um, I always thought it was useful because this pro this state that comes here is is very simple, and you are trying to measure deviations from this state. And I think that's also the idea in Sivana's paper. So you have vacuum and everything that all kind of excitations that appear in the vacuum give you signal about the parameter. Okay. Um, so you see. This property of the absorber is when the parameter of the absorber matches the parameter of the system, but you don't know what is the parameter of the system in general, it's unknown. So there will be some discrepancy between them. So typically you will see something coming out close to the vacuum. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that's theta equal to theta zero. Uh, that's, the, that's the product state of the output. And now I want to estimate is theta when the system is a parameter theta and absorber theta zero. Okay, so uh, because the output state is translationally invariant, we said we are in the in this stationary regime. It makes sense to think of observables that are also translationally invariant. And uh, so we define these modes. Um, so for each excitation pattern, we define an associated mode. So what is an excitation pattern? It's just a sequence of uh, zero and one, starting with an one, a one and ending with a one. So something like this, one, zero, zero, one, one, something like that. Um, and for each such pattern, we construct a mode whose creation operator is just, um, you, for a one, you put a sigma plus, for a zero, you put identity. And Okay, you, you take that product and then you shift it and you average. So you shift it along the, the chain and you average. And you divide by square root of n. That's the creation operator of that mode. So for example, for mode one, just a single one, you just have the sum of sigma pluses for the mode one, one is sigma plus on position i, sigma plus on position i plus one. And one on one is sigma i, sigma i plus one, i plus two, yeah? And now you can create a Fox space of, from these creation operators. So if you have some um, number states for each of these patterns, alpha one, alpha n. So say K1 excitation will go to alpha one as well. You just apply these creation operators to the power K1, Km to the vacuum state, uh, just like you do in normal Fox space. Uh, of course, this is not going to be exactly orthogonal, but it's going to be uh, uh, converging to a Fox space in the limit of large n. So, for example, if you take a state with two excitations in the pattern one, this is this kind of state with two ones somewhere in the sequence. Uh, and if I take one excitation of pattern one, one, this will be the state with a one, one somewhere in the sequence, but they, they are next to each other. And now you can, you can see that these two states will be asymptotically orthogonal because these two ones are typically far away from each other. Uh, so this will be always like one on the other one. So, so this you know, brings you the, the structure of the Fox space and these modes are all independent uh, and you have the vacuum state. Okay, and now, the, now what happens, what is the state of these modes when I have my system followed by absorber and there is some mismatch between them, yeah? So the absorber is a parameter theta zero and the system is theta zero plus U over square root of N. So there will be some output coming out and it's not <laughs> exactly the vacuum. And the claim is that all these modes will be populated in a coherent state. So, um, so you have this kind of central limit theorem. If you take the quadratures of the mode alpha, Q and P, they converge in distribution to normals. And uh, the mean of the normal is a constant times this local parameter U. And the variance is one half, so the variance of the back. So these are coherent states of the mode. And the uh, displacement is this mu. And this mu has some expression, it doesn't really matter. And you can also show that the number operator of the mode, so you take A star A for some mode alpha, has asymptotically Poisson distribution, because yeah, that's what you expect for a coherent state. And the intensity of the Poisson is 
mu square times the local parameter square, which are the square of that. Okay. Um, and now the other uh, result is that the quantum Fisher information that I described before is exactly equal to the sum of the quantum Fisher information of all these modes. So each of these modes carry, carries an amount of quantum Fisher information about u because u is in the displacement. And the amount is equal to four times mu square. So if you add all of this, you get exactly the quantum Fisher information. So that means that all the information about the parameter u in the output is in these translational invariant modes. Yeah. So you need to somehow measure them. Um, but now um, we said before the optimal measurement is Q. Uh, and the thing that I was stuck for a long time is I don't know how to measure all the Qs uh, here simultaneously. Although they commute asymptotically because they are independent modes, how do I measure them sequentially somehow? So that's where uh, Susanna's paper helped. So let's look at the, instead of trying to measure quadrature, let's look at the counting measurement. Okay. So I'm just going to measure in the standard basis. So I get outcomes X1, Xn in zero one. And the first thing you can look is uh, the total number of ones. Okay. Uh, because uh, you can uh, calculate this. So there is a closed formula for its moment generating function. And you can look at asymptotic surface. And if you do that, you find that the total number of ones in your trajectory converges in distribution to a sum of independent Poisson with intensities mu alpha squared multiplied, which are multiplied by the number of ones in the in, in that alpha. So what does this mean? It this suggests that basically your number of ones is a bunch of Poisson. So, so it's, it's as if you are measuring these, these modes alpha. Each mode alpha produces a pattern which has alpha, you know, alpha ones, and you are adding them up. So this suggests that the counting process actually performs a joint measurement of all the number operators of all these modes, which I found surprising. Uh, so how, how is that possible? So, um, well, first of all, uh, when you have large N, uh, if you look at the trajectory, you will have all of one, so finite number of, um, of ones in the sequence, essentially. You can just, you can just calculate that. Well, this thing here has a finite, uh, intensity, so the sum of intensities of all these Poisson processes, you add them up, it's finite. So that means that it's a very long sequence with a finite number of ones. So there will be ones or other things separated by many zeros. And what you can do is just identify patterns in the sequence. So this is, you know, from a actual simulation. So here is a pattern 101, here is one, here is one, one, and so on. So for every sequence of outcomes, I can produce, I can count the number of patterns with this function by essentially looking at patterns that are uh, surrounded by lots of zeros. I just count them. So I can go to the patterns and this is basically, uh, this explains this, this convergence here because the number of ones is contained in, in all these patterns that I add up together. Okay, it's not the proof, uh, but um, so the, the claim is that um, the counting process effectively measures these translational invariant modes, number operators, and therefore the distribution of the patterns that you extract in that way is given by this multi-dimensional multi Poisson. Okay, I have a sort of argument here why this is true, but I think this is more convincing. So this is actual simulation where we counted patterns with that sort of um, idea. And you get the histogram of counts for pattern one, 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 one and one, zero, one, uh, and superposed with the Poisson for that intensity that we have. So, so it's not exactly the same. It's all, it's an asymptotic result, but uh, I think it's quite convincing. So, uh, so actually the, 
the counting measurement extracts all this information about about uh, patterns. So we get Poisson intensities for all the different uh, modes. Okay, so but what do we do with that? Um, so the idea is to now uh, do, so this is basically our proposal for, for the estimator. Uh, we'll do a two-stage adaptive uh, strategy. So first of all, in any problem which involves optimal estimation uh, of some unknown parameter, you will need to first kind of roughly know the parameter because the measurement always depends on the parameter. So it's, it's necessarily two stage. Um, so the first stage you use say standard measurements, so no absorber, nothing, just standard measurement on a small portion of the output. So say N to one minus epsilon or some small epsilon. And you compute some preliminary estimator of the parameter. Okay. And then you set the absorber to the value given by this estimator. Okay. But that's where uh, it's kind of a bit uh, subtle. Uh, I want to offset that, that by some delta n. And this delta n has to be like, well, it doesn't have to be, but you can take it to be n to minus one half plus three epsilon. And I'll, if there is time, I'll explain why I need this offset. So I'm not measuring, I'm not putting the absorber to match like uh, for parameter, which is equal to the best guess I have about my unknown parameter. I actually put it offset from them. Okay, and you'll see in a moment why. And I do that and then I just collect pattern statistics. So I get the counts for different patterns. I collect them. And then this is the estimator. It's it's a simple, there is no maximum likelihood or anything. It's a linear estimator. And the reason why it's very simple is because I'm in this uh, sort of linear approximation regime where I already estimated roughly the parameter. And then to find like additional information about theta, I can do something very simple around here. That's a nice trick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a small variation, right? Yes. So it, it uh, you, you still need to do this preliminary estimation, but the second step is easy. And it's just basically adding up all the counts of all the patterns and then multiplying by a constant and subtracting some other constant. Uh, so this stuff here is your uh, local parameter. Okay, so I rewrote it here. Uh, so in terms of this u, you need to multiply by square root of n. And this is the result. Uh, so this is the histogram, the distribution of this U hat when the true U is equal to zero, so we just chose it to be equal to zero. And, um, and this is the Gaussian, which has mean zero, so the true parameter and variance one over F, which is the optimal variance for you know, achieving the quantum Fisher information. Okay, so, so that's, that's basically showing that it works. And now uh, I'll just tell you why I need to actually choose the parameter of the absorber, not at my best guess, but away from it a bit. Um, so let's suppose, so basically I said that things are Gaussian, yeah, uh, in locally. So your, my, my, my state of the output is this coherent state with unknown mean given by this. But I know because of my localization step, I know that the mean is in some ball of size n to the epsilon. So that's this, this stuff here. Okay, so I have localized it. I know it's somewhere inside here. Okay, um, so if I set the absorber at my best guess, um, then I'm inside this ball and this is my unknown parameter. If I would measure Q, that would be optimal. However, I don't have access to Q. And what I'm doing, I'm actually doing uh, photon counting. So if I do photon counting, that means I'm measuring the number operator. And I have this problem I said before of the non-identifiability. So this, this state and this state have the same, give the same statistics in the measurement. Okay. And I call this the null measurement. Uh, so the null measurement uh, doesn't work. 
cannot distinguish between u and minus u. Okay. So instead, what I do is I'm shifting intentionally my, my parameter so that my coherent state of the output is not, doesn't have mean u. It has mean u plus some um, tau n. And this tau n is of the order n to three epsilon. So initially I was in this ball of size n to epsilon. And now what, by adding this, I'm far away from it. Okay. So now there is no more problem of non-identifiability because if I do counting measurement here, I will get something you know, which has this intensity. So I know that I cannot be on the other side because I shifted in that direction. So I just break this symmetry. Okay. Um, moreover, if I just do photon counting with this state, basically I do homodyne measurement. So the photon counting has this Poisson distribution, but because this tau n is quite large, uh, you can expand it and you will find that you are actually measuring Q up to a constant. So, um, okay, so, and, you know, homodyne is based on the idea that if you displace, um, so you measure the displaced number operator, which is this, then you get a star a plus tau a plus a star plus tau square. Uh, if tau is large, this is kind of uh, neglected. This is a constant, and then this is q. So if you subtract this constant and you divide by tau, you measure q. That's that's homodyne. So I can measure the, my optimal observable by doing photon counting, where the parameter is set uh, on purpose far away. And that's all. So that's uh, that's the idea of the optimal measurement. And so uh, let me kind of summarize. So primitive quantum Markov chains satisfy this local asymptotic normality property. So in some sense, the output state is Gaussian who is the parameter in the mean. So it's a coherent state. Um, there is some closed form formula for the quantum Fisher information. Uh, however, we didn't know how to, how to estimate, how to measure this, this state. Uh, so we use coherent absorber because uh, essentially what, what the coherent absorber does is a sort of post-processing. It rotates the output state to a basis that is more convenient for measurement. In, so it rotates it to the vacuum state when the parameters match exactly. And then um, in this vacuum, so near the vacuum state, you have this translational invariant modes and they become asymptotically coherent. They have asymptotically coherent states. And if you do counting, just sequential counting, that effectively is also doing um, number measurements for each of the of these modes. So it simultaneously measures all the number operators of the modes. <laughs> and now with all these counts, uh, we just need to sort of put them together in, a, in an estimator. So we have this two-step adaptive, adaptive procedure where we don't set the coherent absorber at the best guess, but offset. So I call it displaced null measurement uh, in order to achieve the quantum Fisher information through this kind of homodyne uh, idea. And uh, the final estimator is, uh, is very simple. It's just adding up all the counts of patterns that you get in the trajectory, but it's based on the previous step. Um, right, so I showed you how this works in a one dimensional case. Um, this works, well, I haven't done all the details, but uh, I believe it was also in multi-dimensional case. Um, that's, I think that's really, so multi-parameter estimation usually is kind of challenging, but uh, is this idea I think it works. And also in continuous time, so everything works in continuous time. Uh, the modes, instead of having these products of sigmas, you will have operators that are um, this kind of multiple integrals. So say this is an order two one, multiple stochastic integrals with some kernel, which depends on um, the difference between the two types. 
they reintegrate. So it's a yeah, this kind of operator. And you can have it for every level, so multiple integrals. Um, and they are all Gaussian. And you can choose an orthogonal basis uh, of that. 